I am Charlene Margo, the co-founder of Nonprofits at Parent Venture, and we are honored and delighted to have with us tonight Anya Kamenetz and Liz Hurtado, who will be talking with you about how and why to talk with kids about climate change from anxiety to action. Welcome, Anya and Liz. Thank you so much, Charlene. I'm so grateful to be back again, uh, addressing your wonderful community. Thanks to everyone who signed up tonight. I hope a lot of people um, look, come and listen to the recording. I'm going to start by giving a short presentation on sort of the state of the research, what we know about how children are experiencing emotions related to climate change and why it's important to talk them, to them about it and how to talk to them about it. And then I'll be in conversation with Liz um, as she speaks from her grassroots experience as an organizer um, with parents around the country. So um, with your uh, permission, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and um, basically, uh, I've been developing the pres this presentation over the last couple of months. Um, and it is um, a mixture of research that we've done ourselves and research that other people have done. So um, basically, this is a photograph of uh, my neighborhood in Brooklyn in June of 2023. And it's a snapshot of how uh, we are all experiencing frontline impacts of climate change. Um, our vulnerabilities are different. Our life experiences are different, but climate change is affecting everyone and it's affecting kids everywhere. Um, and yet there's a really big gap. So in 2022, I was part of doing a survey with uh, Aspen Institute, this is Planet Ed, and we talked to um, Americans all over the country and we found that more out of than four out of five agreed children do need to know about climate change. They need to know about solutions and causes and impacts so they can be part of building a sustainable future. And yet only half of parents have actually talked to their children about climate change. And we can think of a whole bunch of different reasons. I bet you can think of some reasons why you might not have talked about it, whether that be they're too young, or I'm not so sure of the facts myself, or I'm afraid it's going to scare them. I'm afraid it's going to be controversial. Um, but the fact is that our kids are hearing about climate change. They're experiencing climate change. Um, I've heard research um, recently that said that um, by the time that kindergartners get to school, they already have a perception that um, humans are ruining the earth and the earth is dying. Um, I also recently talked to a um, programmer who's making a video about climate change for tweens. And she said in her focus groups, um, very few of the kids, these are tweens now, so fifth graders, sixth graders, very few of them understood the causes of climate change, but that didn't stop them from being apathetic and cynical and saying, grownups drop the ball, the planet is dying, we are doomed. So they have a very low awareness of the actual facts. They don't know anything about solutions, but they have a terrible attitude about it at the same time. Um, the, the quote up on the screen here is 75% of young people say the future is frightening. That's from a large global study that was done in 2021. It's going to be updated very soon. Um, 10,000 young people across 10 countries, 45% of them in that study um, said that their feelings about climate change were actually debilitating, that they were interfering with their everyday lives. Um, and so uh, this is a big problem. It's a very widespread problem, and there's a huge amount of silence about it. And that's why I got so passionate about helping, having parents help break that silence. Um, so uh, this is me, of course, with my 12-year-old, now 12-year-old. Um, I also have a seven-year-old, and it's something I'm putting into practice every single day is figuring out how to talk about climate change, the causes, the impacts, and, and the solutions with my kids. Um, and I'm also going from not only the research, but from listening to Gen Z. So this is a quote from um, Azuzina Kadir, who's a 16-year-old uh, climate organizer here in New York City. And I was on a panel with her. And her message also to adults is talk about it. That's one thing I have to say is talk about it. Um, because uh, she said that there's a culture around parents of protecting your children from anything bad in the world. And that's an issue because it is scary, but there's a lot of hope and a lot of actions we could take to create more hope. Um, and I think that this is really, really important because the misconception is that we can shield our kids from the truth of the world. Um, the reality is that the only thing we can protect them from is being alone with the truth. So we can protect them by letting them know that they're not alone, letting them know that um, that you're there with them, that you understand and you're ready to hear their feelings. And that's really the strategy that we're going to take as we talk about climate change with our kids. 
Um, so I was part of creating um, a resource, um, a written resource, um, talking to young people about climate emotions. Um, there's a guide with a script for elementary school students. There's one for middle and high school students with the basic facts, as well as questions to ask. And that's a guide that anyone can download. Um, but you know, the steps that I give for people who want to go through this is um, number one, secure your own oxygen mask. Number two, ask questions, but also listen. Number three, introducing coping mechanisms. So how do we cope with our feelings? Number four, tech, take action. Um, and step five, repeat, because we know that just like with the birds and the bees talk, or if you talk to your kids about gun safety or drugs, it's not just one conversation. It's going to be a series of appropriate conversations at developmental stages as they get older, and we're not going to just take one bite of the apple, right? So stepping one, securing your own oxygen mask. Climate change is scary for everybody, everybody who spent some time thinking about it. Um, and parents in particular. So research um, done by um, one of Liz's colleagues, Elizabeth Bechard, shows that parents feel guilty. They feel guilty for bringing their kids into a world that has an uncertain future. Um, and this is sometimes described as moral injury. So we feel implicated um, that we brought our kids here and that contributes to the silence, right? It contributes to not talking about it. Um, research also says that parents use distancing strategies. So distracting themselves, distracting their kids, talking about anything else. Um, the other really interesting finding in the research is that at, by embracing the challenges of climate change, going toward the feelings instead of away from them, it can actually be very surprisingly a catalyst for personal growth, for meaning and for hope. So I, that's certainly I, something I would say for myself personally, as a mother of two, I had a lot of climate anxiety felt powerless. And when I started really engaging into the problem and starting trying to thinking about becoming a, the, you know, how I could be part of the solution as a, you know, in my personal choices, as a citizen, an activist in my work, um, it all turned around. And so the thing that had been the scariest thing really became the biggest source of meaning in my life. So I can certainly speak to that. Um, Step two, once we have our own support networks in place, maybe friends, family, pe trusted people we can talk to about climate change, then we're ready to broach the topic with our kids. We know that it might not be a time and place of our choosing. Um, it could be a story on the radio, in the car. It could be something they hear at school um, or just a question out of the blue. Um, but the time now then to ask is, you know, these questions, right? You can, if you start the question, the conversation, you can say, have you thought about climate change? What do you know about climate change? What do you think about when you hear those words? Um, do you know Greta Thunberg? What does she fight for? What have you noticed? Um, I, I did focus groups with families uh, from around the country about climate change conversations. And every single family I talked to all over the country could name a firsthand experience. And that was either a, you know, a forest, a wildfire smoke, a flood, a heat wave, or just changes in the seasons like a spring coming earlier or not enough snow in the winter. So talking about these signs that we see around us. And then the important question to ask is, how are you feeling about this, right? Um, and, you know, we really want to be always validating our kids' feelings, thanking them for speaking up, you know, validating their choice to speak up, um, normalizing these feelings. Lots of people feel this way, not feeling like you have to have all the answers. You can always look things up together um, and always ask you to hear more. Um, and then we all know the, the you know, um, the, the, you know, wanting to shut down the conversation is something that comes when we're uncomfortable. So always opening it up for more or saying, hey, I, I, that's a good question. I want to think about it and let's come back to it later. Um, my step three, suggested step three, is that we learn about climate feelings. So, um, you know, climate feelings are a big range. It doesn't have to all be negative, but I think it's important when it comes to um emotions and particularly adolescents and their developing emotions. This is a quote from Lisa Demore, um, an incredible expert when it comes to the psychology of teenagers. And she reminds us mental health, it's not about feeling good, calm, or relaxed all the time. It's about having feelings that fit the circumstances and managing those feelings well. It is not unusual and it is not irrational to be worried about climate change, afraid about climate change. It is rational, right? We're feeling grief because Things are happening in the world and we need to make space to help our kids validate those feelings and to understand that it's possible to feel a lot of different kinds of feelings in relationship to climate change. 
Um, so this is the climate emotions wheel that we created a climate mental health network that is being used in schools and in libraries. It helps adults and children um, explore their climate emotions and understand that these emotions are going to change. They may evolve. And especially as you express your emotions, find an outlet for them, whether that's music, dancing, art, meditation, spirituality, time in nature, um, or just talking with a friend or being with a pet, these emotions are going to flow and they're going to change. It's when we rush away from our emotions or when we stuff them down that we really start to have problems. Um, finally, we're going to segue, and I'm going to segue into the conversation with Liz because we're going to talk about taking action. Um, things that cause us anxiety generally in the world, um, we don't overcome anxiety by avoiding the thing that causes us anxiety. We avoid, we overcome anxiety by having controlled exposure. Um, and when it comes to something as big as climate change and something as real as climate change, we need to take action, right? So um, there's all kinds of ways in which people can take action. You can take action, again, as I mentioned, in your political um, way, turning out the vote as a consumer with the personal choices that you make about housing, transportation. Um, if As an investor, if you're lucky enough to have savings, you're part of a um, an organization that has a pension plan, for example, banking is a really important way that we prop up the fossil fuel industry. Um, and then as a professional in your place of work, how can your industry, how can your institution, your organization become more climate aware? Um, so these are all the realms that we work in. Um, and we want to make sure that there's uh, opportunities for our young people as well to find their climate sweet spot, because the good news is that there are so many solutions out there. There's so many opportunities, whether they want to become activists, whether they want to become scientists or sustainability professionals um, or become artists and creative people. There's so many different ways to respond to this crisis. And um, the more that we talk about it, the less we're going to be alone in those feelings. Um, so I hope that this has um, been a little bit of food for thought. I'm going to now segue into the conversation with Liz. And I want to remind you that there's... Um, Please, lots of room for your questions. You can put them in the chat and um, Bev and Charlene are gonna help us uh, handle all of those. So um, Liz, bringing you in, I just wanna know like, how did you get into doing this kind of work and how does your identity as a parent um, relate to the climate work that you do? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you all so much for having me on this platform. I'm really excited for this conversation. It's something that Anya knows I'm very passionate about. Um, you know, I am a mother of four kids, um, and all of them are very unique in their needs, their learning styles, you know, their interests. Um, but one thing that we definitely do talk about at home is climate change, you know, what we're experiencing, what they're hearing at school, what they're absorbing through all the various channels. So this opportunity to come into a space like Mom's Plain Air Force was truly, you know, a blessing. Um, connecting my previous work experience with this network of moms all across the country who are actively fighting to protect our children's health. You know, we fight for clean air, we fight for protections against the impacts of climate change. And as we know, our children are most vulnerable. So as a mother, this work is deeply, um, deeply important to me. Um, and as a Latina, specifically, you know, working within this Eco Madres program, it's so important for me to be able to reach other communities that have been uh, disproportionately impacted, such as our Latino communities. They mm -hmm. have, you know, extensive burdens, compounded burdens that they face. And as we know, climate change uh, and air pollution is not distributed evenly among all communities. So within Eco Madres, we try to make sure that we are providing information that is accessible, providing information um, both in English and Spanish, right, to help um, mitigate those language barriers, for example, and to make it culturally relevant um, so that people are actively receiving this information and learning about the various ways that they can take action. So would you mind giving me an overview of some of your campaigns? Why do you use the lens of clean air? Why is that so powerful? Yeah, I mean, we need clean air to breathe, right? <laughs> so that really is the foundational point at Mom's Clean Air Force. Um, you know, we've been fighting for years to protect our children from, from uh, air pollution and the various sources of where air pollution comes from. Um, we have chapters all across the country where our organizers, you know, go out into the community and build these networks that are gonna 
come together and fight for stronger protections. We've worked both at the national level, at the local level on various policy issues around environment, climate, and health. And we're always aiming to make that connection, right? It's not always that clear for folks to understand the connection between environmental harms and our ch children's health, but that's something that we've actively been pushing for since day one, for people to understand. Um, and while, you know, working across both sides of the aisle um, can be challenging for various different topics that people talk about, this is one that you just can't, um, you know, dismiss. Everyone cares about their children. Everyone has a child in their life that they care about or grandchildren, right? So this is a topic that really is very personal to anyone that we talk to. Again, we, we work with people at all levels of government and this is the one thing that we bring to the table. You know, we have mothers and fathers, caregivers of all types across the country who have stories of how they've been impacted by climate change, by the various sources of air pollution, whether they're living next to a polluting highway or, you know, there's a refinery in, in their, their school's backyard, you know. These are real stories and we try to make the connection between the person or I should say the statistics often, right? And the person, there's real people behind this. And so that's why we fight so hard for what we like to say, justice in every breath. Um, mm -hmm. believe that every community, every family, every kid deserves to breathe clean air. And um, you know, we're not gonna stop fighting until we are breathing clean air and that our kids have healthy environments to, that they can thrive in. Um, as you go around the country and as you work with families from different backgrounds, are you hearing reports of climate anxiety? Are people worried about climate change beyond the immediate impacts that they're seeing? Absolutely. And there's various reports that have come out in recent years about the scale of this anxiety or these various climate emotions, you know, particularly in the Latino communities, um, that number is quite high. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of our communities, um, well, a lot of our families actually come from countries that have experienced, you know, climate disasters and have migrated to the United States. But even here within these borders, we are experiencing that at an alarming rate um, and it is impacting us. And yeah. oftentimes folks may think that it's not like a primary concern in our communities, but it very much is. Um, we have competing, um, you know, competing things in our life, you know, that at, from time to time, it may take our focus away from what we may be experiencing at our homes, at our work, in our children's school, um, and that's really where we come in with Eco Madres. You know, we try to make this as easy as possible to make those connections, but then also to take action. Um, I know personally as a mother of four children, my kids are eight, I have two five-year-olds, and then I have a ninth grader. So you can understand the various uh, demanding schedules that we have at home. And so it can be hard to think about adding one more thing to your schedule, right? You very well know, even with two kids, even with one kid, they take a lot of our time and we're we're busy. And so to add one more thing, um, we try to kind of lessen that burden on a parent or on a caregiver. We try to make the steps to take climate action as easy as possible, whether that's in the form of, um, you know, signing a petition. We bring that information to you again in a digestible way. Hey, these are the facts. This is how it's impacting us. This is why it's important to take action. And here's an easy, you know, link that you can click and, and do your part. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that many times we think that our small actions, you know, don't matter, but we aim to remind everyone that every single action, no matter how small, how big, every action um, counts, you know, if we're talking about protecting our children's health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you find for yourself personally that action is an antidote to anxiety? Personally, absolutely. And from the various stories that we've heard, again, from, from folks all across different states, um, that kind of, that narrative re definitely resonates. You know, we talk about collective activism, coming together, you know, in a community, in a group, whatever the setting may be, but people coming together and taking action together is really, really empowering. Um, the climate crisis is just a lot to handle on your own. You know, it's extremely overwhelming. And as you showed in that climate wheel, there's so many emotions that we can experience even in one day. Yeah. And it can be a lot. 
Mm -hmm. And we often don't take time to really sit with those feelings or those emotions. But when we come into a space where we're, you know, um, taking action with a group, whether it's joining a rally or um, hosting a tabling event to talk about the plastic pollution, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. you know, just building on those connections really does empower someone to continue to take action because they see the impact um, that it's making in their community. So it sounds like what you're saying is like, um, it's it's interesting, as you say it, I'm, I'm making the connection that, I mean, obviously we know that for political organizing, their relationships are so important, right? That's really the bread and butter of what you do is connecting people to more people. But that's also true from a mental health standpoint, right? Being able to have those relationships and to know that you're not alone. So it really does serve a dual purpose. That's exactly right. I mean, we talk, at least as mothers, right? We talk about, mm -hmm. we, need, we need a village around us really to help take care of our children. And that's exactly what we're trying to build, right? We, we want to build and continue to build on this village of um, caregivers and really anyone concerned with children's health and their future and our future generations. Yeah. And um, what we aim to do again is connect people with opportunities to act. So when we talk about testifying, for example, a lot of times folks don't even know that they have certain rights to share mm -hmm. their stories or to make any kind of demand when it comes to stronger protections, for example. So one of the things that we do um, at Moms and at Equal Mavid is we provide workshops. So we mm. say, you know, join us this evening and we can share what it means to testify in front of the EPA. What is this protection that's coming out right now? Um, many folks may know that EPA has been releasing a lot of um, stronger protections, whether it's for clean transportation, we're expecting yeah protections are mercury, which we know are is extremely harmful for our children and for our pregnant moms. And mm -hmm. so when these opportunities arise, we help moms and caregivers prepare to share their story and to, you know, provide that space where they feel comfortable even in sharing their story because, you know, those are personal um, experiences. And it may be hard even to talk about it within our own families. I know as a Latina, um, mental health is definitely not something that we talked about growing up. Mm. Um, now in 2024, you know, those conversations are happening more and more, but there's a lot of generational trauma in our communities that we're still getting past in terms of talking about emotions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so again, just kind of breaking down those barriers, helping to facilitate connections like you were saying you know, connecting um, a mom who's been impacted or, or her child who has been impacted with their local decision maker mm -hmm. and really telling the story of why it is so important to protect their health and to, you know, strengthen protections in their community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's your strategy between now and the election? Like, what are your top priorities as a group? I mean, it, I think it's all the same year to year, right? Um, especially right now, we definitely need to protect the um, advancements that we've made. You know, with the Inflation Reduction Act, we've seen so many investments in clean energy and updating infrastructures at schools. You know, a lot of schools have outdated HVAC systems, many are without. And with these extremes, you know, and temperatures, um, I think it's critically important that we um, support these investments and that we protect them. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we, I'm happy to share some of the petitions that we have, but one in particular is, you know, calling on all your members of Congress and saying, we need to protect these critical climate investments because we've never seen them before and we may never see them again. So right now really is the, take, is the time to take action on those. Is part of that also like a voter education? Because I know that lots of people don't necessarily understand everything that the IRA has brought, right? That's exactly right. Yes. And you mentioned campaigns. So that's definitely some of the campaigns that our organizers, um, you know, kind of have as our primary focus, you know, yeah. kind of break down what even is the IRA? What is this, you know, clean Inflation energy? Reduction Act, if people don't know what that is, right? <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So yeah, we break it down and, and kind of pull out those pieces that are coming because they're coming fast. There's a lot of investments happening and we don't want people to miss these opportunities. And I say people broadly, I mean, we don't want school districts to miss these opportunities. Like one of the big campaigns that we worked on and continue to work on is the clean school bus program from the EPA. Mm -hmm. And so this is um, money that is 
being distributed to districts all across the country for um, electric school buses, you right. know, to their school, school bus fleets. And as we know, electric school buses don't emit any um, emissions, cleaner air, not just for our kids, but for our school bus drivers and overall for our community. So those are some of the campaigns that we actively work on. Um, but to your point, you know, this critical piece is not often talked about in the environmental and climate space, which is mental well-being and mm -hmm. how to even have these conversations with our children. Um, and I know for me, with my four kids who you may hear because they're trying to get to bed right now, um, it's night, I'm in the East Coast in Virginia Beach, so it's 9 p.m. for me, kids are going to bed. But when we talk about these things at home, you know, I have to, I have to really think about how to have those conversations individually. We all know kids are very different in their needs um, and their capacity to, to handle certain amounts of information. Um, like my youngest, obviously, he prefers, you know, fun type of activities or um, picture books, right? That's kind of one fun, engaging way to share the message about what even is air pollution? What does it mean to have dirty air versus clean air? And not something you see most of the time, right? So mm -hmm. actually our co-founder um, of Moms Clean Air Force, Dominique Browning, she co-authored co a book called Every Breath We Take. Mm -hmm. It offers such a clear connection to, to what may pollute our environment mm -hmm. and what it means to fight for clean air. Mm -hmm. And you know, finding those ways to connect the dots with your children, I think is really important. I totally agree. I want to put a link to that in the chat. And I also want to share, there's actually a new video that's out that in my, um, with my hat on from This Is Planet Ed, I was a little bit a part of the development of it. But basically, um, it's a it's a video that's aimed at tweens. And it gives the basic facts on climate change, but it also gives a little bit of a lens on solutions. Because, you know, following up from the research that I talked about in the presentation, you know, kids don't really know, they they might have heard about the problem, but we don't spend as much time talking about solutions. So it's important that they understand that and have a positive spin and and, and also know what opportunities there might be for themselves to get involved. Um, so that's, that video has become, it just came out, so it's become really popular. Um, what are some of the other tougher conversations you've had with your kids about climate change? I mean, have they expressed anxieties to you, the older ones maybe? You know, they haven't as much, to be honest, but the other night, um, and again, we live in Virginia Beach, coastal yeah. community here. Um, what we often get are, you know, potential bad storms and hurricane alerts. Yeah. And weeks ago, we received a tornado warning at like 1 a.m. Mm -hmm. So that was alarming for us, but that's not something we ever really experience here. Mm -hmm. um, and so the kids definitely had questions. <laughs> They definitely had questions, you know, they they know the work that I do and they know why it's so important and, and what's happening in our environment. So they're like, is it happening now? Mm. Right. It does create various emotions and, and various conversations to ensure um, they have the facts, right? But also, like you said, know that it's that they have the power within themselves to take action themselves, no matter what age they may be. Like my 11-year-old, um, he has been a nature baby since day one. He's the one that I would, you know, put on my baby carrier and go for long hikes. And he still, to this day, seeks being out in nature. Um, so one thing that he loves to do is go um, plant trees. Mm -hmm. We connected with a local nonprofit who works on protecting our watersheds here. And they host, they host community um, tree planting. And so he's mm -hmm. always waiting, like, okay, when's the next event? When is the next time that we can go plant mm -hmm. trees? Because mm -hmm. he can actively do something, like with his hands, right? And mm -hmm. just outdoors. Whereas um, my other daughter, Lena, she loves to use her voice to make change. And mm -hmm. she discovered this at a very early age. Um, and actually within moms, you know, we had the privilege to speak at an EPA press conference where Lena had the opportunity to introduce um, a Administrator Regan for a big announcement on clean transportation. And that's, wow. yes, that sparked like, I don't know, she is now 100% going to be, if not right now, she is an activist, but she 100% is going to be leading, you know, the clean energy future movement 
because mm-hmm. that experience invigorated her, mm-hmm. you know? And so she perhaps doesn't feel, you know, heavy or negative or sad emotions. She actually falls into that spectrum that you showed where it's, um, uh, what was one of the emotions? Positivity, curiosity, empathy. All of those. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Interest. Um, yeah. That's so wonderful to hear. And I mean, it sounds like it's really just, you're, you're really exemplifying this, this dynamic, right. Of turning into action and it being something where you're really focusing on positive outcomes and so that your kids are following in that as well. Yeah. Um, do you have any questions for me based on the presentation? I know that you've seen this stuff a bunch of times. Yeah. I mean, I would love to dive a little bit more, um, into, I think that you just mentioned, right. The teens, teens are, you know, getting ready to take the next steps and they feel like the weight is on them. I know yeah. my ninth year really hasn't felt those kinds of emotions yet, but I would love, you know, your take on what are some of the best perhaps strategies or narratives that we're talking to, um, that we're sharing with our high schoolers and beyond. Yeah, that's such a great question. You know, I really, I do find a lot of times when I talk to parents, they seem a little bit stumped because it really is the teen's job in some ways at that age to differentiate from their parents. So it's almost like if you have a parent who's particularly concerned about climate change, it's un, it's unusual that the, that the child will be like, yes, I care about it just as much as you do. And I want to be just like you, dad um, or mom. So you have to take a really more subtle approach. And I think the focus often is on, um, you know, teens really want to be of service and they want to have something unique to contribute to the world and to find their passion and to find their peer group. And so, you know, offering them opportunities and making it visible for them that there are different opportunities where there are people that they admire that are getting engaged. And whether that be on social media or traditional media, or whether that be in the community around you, where there's role models that aren't necessarily you, the adults, but they are, um, you know, younger adults or children, you know, teenagers that age, who are doing really cool things, who are entering contests, who are making art, who are speaking out um, and writing about this. And I think that that's really, that's where I see teens really discovering their place and, and, and coming along. And there's so much camaraderie and closeness. I was over the weekend at the Climate Reality Leadership Corps training and hanging out with some of the a group of college students um, who were from Sunrise Generation and they had come from all different parts of the country and they knew each other from online organizing. And, you know, they just, this was, this is their life. This is what they love to do. And, and it's just like anything else that teens get passionate about. So I think offering those opportunities, but I also believe really um, sincerely that, you know, it's not necessarily for them to take on and we're not trying to shape or mold them into a particular type of activist. It's really for us as adults who have this sense of responsibility for the next generation, we brought them into this world. Um, the more that they see that we're kind of doing the work, I think at, you can see it in your kids, it sounds like. They don't have to worry about it. They shouldn't have to worry about it. They need to have room to be kids and and trust that adults are going to do their part because there really is a sense of, I mean, one of the toughest things that I confront when I'm in conversation with teens is the sense of betrayal that they have. Um, that adults did this, they didn't, they're not helping, that there are people in power that aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. And nobody's even talking about it, you know, and that's the one part, right, that we can, we can definitely do something about. We can break the glass, break the silence and acknowledge their feelings and, and, and get over our own perhaps sense of guilt or moral injury and, and say, yeah, you know what, I want to talk to you about this because I agree with you to a certain extent that, the, you know, there's things that our generation should have done differently. And now it's time to kind of um, forge a new path. I think that's fantastic. I think, um, Definitely one of the things that we aim to do is acknowledge those hard feelings, right? Yeah. Um, not just let them, you know, sink or allow them to sink in rather, I should say, but then talk about them, create that space for them to openly share. So I know many kids don't, you know, or they don't even recognize what emotions they may be feeling, but providing some kind of guidance into tapping into those emotions and being able to identify where they're coming from or where um, they may be stemming from, I think is great, greatly important. Um, one other question, actually, as you mentioned, yeah. you made the decision to bring kids into this world. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that's a big conversation right now. A lot of people are 
questioning whether they should have children. Um, and that's something I believe that you've, you've done some research on. So can you share any insights about that and then how um, that narrative is taking place right now? Oh my gosh, I just interviewed Jade Sasser today. She's the author of a new book, Climate Anxiety and the Kid Question. And she has a podcast as well about this. And what's unique about it is that she's delving specifically into the um, the experiences of people of color. So a lot of the media coverage of this phenomenon is really focused on white women. And um, she's found that climate anxiety um, is heightened actually among people of color and also people from frontline communities. So there is a lot of climate anxiety specifically around reproduction and having kids and, um, you know, in these communities as well, but that there's a countervailing force, which is a lot of pressure to have kids um, that comes from people, you know, coming from conditions of survival and um, just having a very pro-family culture, right? And sometimes in marginalized communities, because they might not have had full reproductive justice. They might not have had the right to have their own kids, whether that's coming from slavery, whether that's coming from crossing the border and being immigrants, I know in my Jewish community, there's a pro, very pro-natalist approach as well that is about repopulating the world after Hitler. So these cultural baggage that we're carrying, and that's running straight into the threat um, of, of what is this world going to look like in 2050, 2060. So it's a maelstrom of emotions um, that her, she interviewed, you know, students, people in their 20s. Um, and uh, number one, she said, you know, to talk about it is really important. People shouldn't have to carry this on their own because this really is a collective experience. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of interesting similarities. You know, I think we know this, right? Whether you have kids or you don't, the climate guilt does not go away. So it's not like you can manage this by having kids or not having kids. You have kids, you're going to feel this sense of responsibility, this sense of obligation. Um, but I think that, you know, the the really radically hopeful part of it is the idea that um, we all share responsibility for the next generation, whether you have your own biological kids or not, and that's absolutely a personal choice. Um, but the sense of being involved in the future and having a stake in the future, having skin in the game, I think that's something that ideally we all share. And so it releases it a little bit from the question of your individual guilt, your individual burden, and really, just as you were talking about with the political organizing, Building those relationships, sharing these concerns and talking about it will help people realize that maybe lighten it a little bit just to say, yeah, everybody's people are really worried. And you know what? There's also a historical um, things to learn from our ancestors, things to learn from um, early, earlier generations, because we're not the first group of people to give birth in a society or in a situation that's very scary or very uncertain. And so that strength that we might have from our ancestral history that may be something that can help us to reframe the, the conditions that we're in right now. That's greatly insightful. And I cannot wait to pick up the book. So thank you for putting that link in the in yeah. the um so actually one thing that I, I was thinking about are like all the all the actions that we take here at home. Um yeah. I discussed how with the knowledge that we have, right, as adults, with the knowledge that we have, we try to teach our kids, you know, how to protect our environment, how to protect the planet, what we can do within our personal power to mitigate, you know, the impacts. Um, but how do we prevent from, like you said, burdening our kids with with these tasks? At home, for example, you know, we may reduce our meat consumption, consumption or um, trade that plastic toy for, an experience, right? Like, let's go get ice cream instead of purchasing that ten dollars toy that they're going to forget about next week. Like, yeah. how do you balance those? Um, I don't know changes in behavior within your family. I'm going to say that that's a tricky thing. I think it's case by case, you know, because I do feel like there's um, you don't want to cross to the level of imposing, you know, certain ideas on your kids in a way that is going to make them feel deprived or going to make them feel upset or resentful. Um, I think for myself, you know, there's, um, I really do try to put it into the context of, you know, we do collective action. So we do political action, we talk to our officials, we, sh we show up at rallies, we speak out, and the consumer actions are are important, but not as important. And even on the consumer action level, you know, a lot of that is invisible. So, you know, having solar panels on our house, having an electric um we we turn switch to an induction stove, and so these are things that don't impact our quality of life, but they're they're better in a lot of ways. Um, 
deciding with my kids uh, on when we're going to take public transportation versus take a car, right? When we're traveling around Brooklyn or around New York City, um, that's something that um, is a trade-off and we talk about the trade-offs, right? So we say, okay, we're going to walk to the train, maybe we'll take a car back, you know, and, and kind of compromise and, and decide together. But just trying to be honest with them and be clear with them and not, um, you know, you don't want to make anyone else a martyr to your own beliefs, right? Ideally, your kids are going to be leading the way for you and you don't want to be pushing or dragging them along um, because ultimately, you know, again, the, the individual consumer level action is not where it's at. So why, why, why turn everything into a fight, right? Yes, I couldn't agree more. Um, is that how the approach that you guys take? I mean, how do you do it? You have a blended household too. So there might be some complications. Exactly right. You know, like I know what my beliefs are. They're definitely not the same as my husband's, you know, and we may, I don't know, argue over which laundry detergent to use because that one is too much plastic in my home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but no, with my kids, you know, it's, it's definitely a different approach. Um, yeah. like can impose those same things we can teach them about the why why i'm taking this decision yeah. to me or whatever it may be yeah. um but you know having them recognize that it's a much larger problem than our individual you know behaviors um and you talked about uh polluters you know we don't we do talk about holding polluter polluters accountable and what that means um yeah. And I think it is important, you know, again, they're not going to be the ones signing these petitions, but they may, may be the ones joining us at that rally and, you know, adding to that crowd that is going to make a change. So I love that. I love that you really do, um, you know, put a lot of value into that collective activism because we do the same here. I just think it's so important because it's so easy. I feel like it really is the fossil fuel industry's greatest trick, right? To make us think it's all our fault. It's all about our carbon footprint and particularly on moms, because we are the ones with the purchasing power. We get so exhausted trying to make the perfect, right? Sustainability decision. And if I open up my Instagram, I'm going to see a flood of, you know, sustainable products, this and that. And um, it takes so much energy, right? To, and it And that kind of saps your energy, which you could be using for something really different maybe more impactful, hopefully more impactful. That's exactly right. We've had these conversations, you know, with various colleagues, actually, I was just chatting with one of my colleagues in Florida about um, the need for plastic reduction, right? We're actively fighting against the petrochemical industry because they continue to ramp up um, their harmful practices. And primarily these, um, you know, this production is happening in BIPOC communities in black, indigenous, you know, low wealth communities, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and so we're actively fighting against those things, but really, you know, what is the other alternative, right? And really what we need to get to is reduction, but we need to make sure they're the ones doing the reduction. We can't fully yeah. take that, um, that weight, you know, we can't put that weight on us to make that plastic pollution in, issue go away we definitely yeah. have to put the weight on them since you know they're the ones polluting the world yeah extended producer responsibility that's the that's the watchword um we're heading into the q a we have a couple of um great questions and really want to encourage more um but the first one i want to take is this question i think it's a great one do your children appear in social media related to your activism and how do you balance that with their privacy rights and is there an ethical balanced way to share in particular their anxiety and grief with the world in order to draw attention to climate change? Um, yeah, that's such a great question. It's something I definitely, you know, before I covered climate change, I wrote about um, social media and kids. And um, one person that I support a lot in their work is Devorah Heitner. And she's a really big advocate of just asking your kids about sharing. So even from a young age, you know, before you put a photo up, really ask their permission um, and check in with them. And also think about, of course, in ways that they may not be able to about where it might, how it might look in a few years. So, you know, over the years, in particular with my older child who really, you know, controls their own self-image, um, I do ask them and I post less and less of their photos over time. Um, when it comes to writing about them, I have a unique, I'm in a I'm in the second generation because my parents both are writers and they both have written about, you know, they wrote about me and my sister as children a little bit. Um, so I can feel it. I really feel it from both sides. And again, it's a matter of of um, putting into context. Um, there's certainly been times when I've written about my my kids 
Um, but there are so many things that I don't write about. And there's so many things that are off limits and I think would always be off limits um, because they are growing and developing and they need privacy for that. Yeah, I think that's really well said, Anya. You know, Bev and I both have young grandchildren now. And so we're really watching how careful this generation is with putting their children on social media. And I know you do it very carefully and very thoughtfully, uh, but it's a balancing act, isn't it, Liz and Anya? Exactly right. Yeah. So, you know, a couple of questions. And then there's one really long, lovely essay here from someone that I want you to read and respond to. But just I have a, a few more questions that have come in earlier I want to ask you. One is you mentioned, of course, teens like Greta Thunberg that have had such an impact on international global advocacy. You know, I was a child of a, a teenager in the 70s when Earth Day first started. Do you see that teens have always been a driver in work around climate advocacy? So, um, you know, climate change is inherently has a generational uh, aspect to it, right? Because the it is the year that you were born impacts what you're going to see in your lifetime. Um, at the same time, it's interesting to note, Dana Fisher is a researcher I just recently interviewed, and she's found that the climate movement is, is actually more intergenerational than we might expect. So when we go out and you see who's showing up, um, there's lots of grandmas and, you know, as well as um, younger people and, and notably in the courts. So there's been a lot of high profile cases by children um, suing for their right to a livable climate because of disproportionate impact. There was just a case that was won in Switzerland by elder ladies. It's called the Swiss Grannies case. Um, About that. Yeah, so we all have a stake, you know, but I mean, obviously our young people are, I think it's, a, it's striking a balance. I want them to have a voice and a seat at the table. I don't want them to be carrying it all themselves. Yeah, fair enough. I think that that is a good point. So Liz and Anya, you've been talking a lot tonight about climate anxiety and what that means. I know that that phrase is new, probably not to those of you in the audience, but it is for many people. My question is, how does climate anxiety or eco-anxiety impact kids' overall mental health, whether children or teens? And is this primarily a worry for adolescents or are younger children impacted by it too? Liz, do you have so much research on it. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, I haven't seen research on the youngest, but anecdotally, I can definitely say that this is hitting younger kids. And we do know that anxiety in general is something that the AAP is recommending that very young kids be screened for. So um, basically, um, and I've personally talked to seven and eight year olds who have severe climate anxiety. They worry about the plants, the animals, they worry about trash, they worry about the oceans. Um, and you know, children are born with, so many children are born with such a sense of connection to the natural world. So when they learn about the dangers and the harms, it really does trigger a lot for them. The question of how big a factor is this and the overall issues that we're seeing with the mental health crisis, I think it's just so confounded because there's so many different factors, right? So for example, this has often been brought up to me. We talk about social media and young people's well-being, but a lot of that is they're on a social media feed like TikTok or Instagram, and they're seeing bad news, right? They're seeing things about the world that are happening that are upsetting them. And so is it the world or is it the media, right? Is it the type of messaging or is it the actual message, the, the information? Um, I do know anecdotally from talking to two different people who work in um, mental health uh, crisis lines, text lines, phone lines, that climate change is something that teenagers are mentioning and they're calling in in serious distress. So this is something that's very real. It's a factor. Um, and, you know, in a way, uh, you know, we, we're very, we're very invested in getting people to see the mental health impacts of the climate crisis. Um, but it's only one piece of the overall work that you guys do. And so many people do, because ultimately what do teenagers need, they need supportive adults in their lives. They need to not feel isolated, not feel alone, have peer networks. They need to have meaningful, um, things that they can do in the world where they can develop their talents and develop their voice. And so climate is one way that that can happen. And I think that's probably the best way of looking at it. All right, Anya and Liz, let's let's tackle this question in the Q&A. Anya, do you wanna address or Liz a certain part of it? Please feel free to read the piece that you'd like to respond to. And thank yeah. you. 
Yeah. So we're talking about gaps in policy knowledge and policy education. I think this is super important. And I mean, Liz, I'm going to, I'm going to kick it to you to talk about the kind of policy instruction and education and, and public communication that you do. Yeah, absolutely. So talking about uh, knowledge about the impact of policies, right? Again, I mentioned that many, many people don't know the power that they have, you know, in speaking to their representatives. Uh, I think we tend to forget that they work for us, right? They have to hear us out. They really have to make these decisions that are going to positively, should positively impact us. So I think the more that we know about how our voice can influence decision-making, um, I think it absolutely does uh, have the opportunity to improve, like you mentioned, climate sentiments among young people. You know, they know that they have the power in their hands. They they are more, um, you know, willing to show up in those spaces, perhaps as they grow older and make certain demands, right? We shouldn't have to be in that position, but knowing that we have the ability and that we have the right to do so, I think is really empowering. So yes, absolutely, you know, closing those knowledge gaps is huge, um, not just amongst young people, but really across the board to mitigate any barriers in, you know, uh, being represented here in the country. Um, I'm just going to add to that. I, I put a link in the chat. This is a hobby horse of mine as well, Ray. I think we have a lot of ignorance about civics, basic civics, mm -hmm. and not to mention the role of activism and grassroots movements and social change, right? There's a very shallow and, and thin, paper thin kind of knowledge that, that kids get. It's sort of like triangle shirt waist fire. Oh, civil rights movement. Okay. Now it's the 20th century. Right. And so, um, in the column, it talks about, you know, what is action civics? How can we train our kids or teach our kids to actually find their voice? And what, what role does that have in you know, the basic job of schools, which is to build a democracy and to prepare citizens to participate. Um, so that's, that's something I'm, I, I care about a lot. I think it's really important. I do think that there's, I do think that climate movements are doing a good job. They're getting a lot of kids in the Sunrise Movement, Fridays for Future, and they're organizing. And so in that, you know, there's a lot that kids learn when they actually get engaged in that way. Um, really good question about the absence of dads. Where are the dads? <laughs> it's such a good question. Um, it's totally um, the case. It's, it's just what I've noticed. Um, we know that there's more climate anxiety among women than among men. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, resources or organizations for dads, there is a Climate Dad Twitter account, and there's a new book out actually um, that is a, uh, a, a CNN climate reporter, and it's a letter to his son. So I'm hoping that um, in that coverage of that book that there will be maybe a little bit of conversation on this because I really am a fan of dads <laughs> stepping up and, and being heard on this issue. All right. And so we've been talking about some of the things and we don't have very much time left. I do want to give you each some ending words, but what if you have a child who is not interested, but you as a parent is very interested in climate change? Is there a way to get kids interested? You know, we used to say, uh, think globally, but act locally. We're assuming that's still the case. I mean, it's the ways in which we transmit our values, whatever they are, you know, and create a family culture. I think um, to, in my mind, it has to do with creating positive experiences and rituals and habits that, that contribute to the family culture. So, you know, it could be something, something, whatever it is that makes you passionate about this, whether it is, you know, getting involved in, in conducting, you know, contacting representatives or whether it's being out in nature, you can share that with your kid as part of the family life, but what you can't do is make them think what you think or care about what you care about because we're just not the same as our kids. They're our, their own people. So um, those, are, those are my thoughts on that. I'm a little bit, you know, I really, I really strive to give my kids the room to, to have space for me and to, and to love the things that they love. So the, the best that I can do is kind of try to create a positive experience around the things that I love so that they can love it, try to love it too. Okay, fair enough. And we're getting a lot of excitement around action civics. Yeah. <laughs> if you have any other resources that you'd like to put in about that, we like that phrase. So again, we've come to the last couple of minutes together, Anya and Liz. And, you know, this is a question that we like to ask, but it seems so relevant to you both and the work that you're doing. And that is, 
based on everything that you've seen and studied and experienced right now, what gives you hope? Liz, do you want to go first? I mean, it's so cheesy and you know my answer, but it's my kids. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. You know, as I hear Anya speak about, um, obviously, uh, showing our values through our various experiences, I think that's exactly what empowers me every day to keep up the fight. You know, as overwhelming as it may feel some days, as heavy as the news may be, I see my kids and the actions that they're taking or, you know, the feelings that they're having towards our future, right? Like their future is still bright. Um, and, and they have so many goals and so many aspirations. And even though some days I may fall into that like climate doom, like, oh my gosh, what, what's going to happen 10 years from now? they don't see that right they they're like okay we still have time there is still time to make change so mm -hmm. that for them they they really are the ones that keep me hopeful and keep me going every day mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Liz. That's really beautiful. I know my granddaughter attended her first first Earth Day at eight weeks. And I think, you know, this is what we got to do, right? We got to start them early. Anya, how about you? I know you've seen and experienced a lot in your career. <laughs> I mean, honestly, right now I'm full of a lot of gratitude. I think that, that you know, hope is, I don't want to base my well-being on a prediction of what's going to happen in the future. What I'm, I'm grateful for the ability to do this work and grateful for the people that are doing it with me, who are in it with me, who are willing to look at the truth and um, for the passion of so many people around us who, who see what's going on and who want to make things better. So I'm powered by a lot of gratitude and a lot of sense of purpose right now. Thank you, Anya. That was beautiful. Well, we have come to the end of our hour together, but Liz Hurtado and Anya Kamenetz, we could not be more grateful. This is a conversation, as both of these wonderful professionals said, it's not a one and off with our kids. It's something that we've got to do a lot, and we've got to show it through our values and our love for our kids and all of those hearts. Don't you just love that? So we thank you both so much for being here. We hope that we will continue this conversation. And again, thank you, thank you, Anya and Liz. And everybody was with us today. Wonderful questions, wonderful participation. We are all grateful. Thank you, everybody. We hope to see you again soon. Good night.